Holly Smith. I am a nurse midwife, and I am one of the toolkit co-authors and lead editors. Um, also on the line today is Nancy Peterson, who is a nurse practitioner and another one of the toolkit co-authors and lead editors. She's also the director of perinatal outreach and a clinical program manager at CMQCC. And she'll be around at the end to assist with answering questions if need be. Um, not on the call today are a couple of the other uh, lead editors. That includes Dr. David LeGrew, who also chaired the, uh, the National AIM Bundle for the Reduction of Primary Cesarean, uh, and Dr. Elliot Main, who is the Medical Director of CMQPC, and they will be doing future uh, introductory toolkit webinars, but for today, it's myself and Nancy. So thanks again for joining us. I'm super excited about just how many people signed up in a matter of just uh, you know, 24 to 48 hours to hear this webinar. So let's, let's jump right in. So here we have very quickly, this is what today's webinar is going to look like. We're going to talk about the wide variation in cesarean rates across Cal California and the nation, why we should care about that, um, why it takes a village, takes a lot of different components to successfully reduce cesarean birth rates, and then we're going to go step by step through the toolkit and talk about each section um, and the strategies and the tools that are included in the toolkit. We'll also briefly go over the pilot hospitals and the success stories there. And then after all this, you're going to be wondering uh, what to do first, and that has to do with the implementation guide that can be downloaded at the CMQCC website alongside the toolkit. So most people on the call today are probably familiar with the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative, or CMQCC as we call it, but since this is a national call, there might be some folks who aren't as familiar. Um, so just very quickly, I'll, I'll give a brief explanation of who's uh, what CMQCC is and what we do. Uh, CMQCC started back in 2006 to 2007 timeframe with a founding mission to end preventable morbid morbidity and mortality in the California maternity care. And through, uh, through that, we create statewide multidisciplinary task forces that develop uh, QI toolkits and implementation guides, as well as large-scale quality collaboratives across the state. And we're proud to say that many of these tools and concepts have been widely adopted by other states and nationally. Probably the one that folks are most familiar with is the Toolkit for the Elimination of Early Elective Delivery that was uh, released back in 2010 as a joint project with the March of Dimes. And that quickly became a national model for the elimination of early elective delivery. Since then, we've also done the response to OB hemorrhage, which was released in 2010, which is second edition that just came out at the end of last year. Uh, and many people are also familiar with the response to create cramp state toolkit in 2013. This year has been a big year for us. Uh, obviously, we released the cesarean reduction toolkit. And, uh, and Nancy right now is probably, as we speak, working on the venous thromboembolism toolkit, which should be out uh, shortly later this year, hopefully. Here's a slide that shows um, CMTCC's key partners. I'm not going to read through all of these, but it's important to know about because this is a collaborative and uh, many state agencies are involved in what we do, as well as membership associations like the Hospital Quality Institute, the Pacific Business Group on Health. Um, consumer groups are really important to our endeavors, including the California Healthcare Foundation that um, funded this toolkit, March of Dimes, uh, various professional groups uh, and organizations like ACOG and A1 and ACNM and so forth, and then key medical uh, leaders around the state. So here's a slide about maternal mortality in California and across the U.S., and I know we're not talking about maternal mortality today, but I think this um, slide is important to show because it really reflects the success CMQCC has had with its model of quality improvement. Um, so basically you can see here that back in 2008, uh, the maternal mortality rate in California really mirrored uh, that of the national rate with about 14 to 15 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. And over the years, the national rate has gone up, um, peaking there at 22 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births in 2013, while the California rate has steadily decreased down to about 7.3 um, per 100,000 live births, which is something we can really I think, be proud of in the sense that California is kind of a diverse nation unto itself, and here we have a maternal mortality rate that reflects some of the best rates in Europe, for example. 
Um, so this all kind of started around the same time that CMTCC started its maternal mortality review and began working on the OB hemorrhage toolkit and the preeclampsia toolkit. Um, and I think it just sort of goes to show what can happen um, when you collaboratively work together with other stakeholders toward the common goal to create change. Now, one of the reasons CMTCC has uh, been so successful, um, if not one of the biggest reasons, is the creation of the California Maternal Data Center, which is truly an innovation in maternity care. Um, so what the California Maternal Data Center is, it's basically an online tool, and right now there are over 100 hospitals enrolled across the state in the data center, and they represent about 75% of all births across California. And so what they do is online, they can provide the data center with discharge diagnosis files, which are automatically linked to birth certificate data and then other, potentially other individual hospital QI measures. And then what is generated um, is rapid cycle performance metrics that get back to these institutions within 45 to 60 days time. So really sort of real time as far as data is concerned. You can see here, this is what sort of is spit back to them are 32 nationally recognized hospital clinical quality measures, including third and fourth degree lacerations, five minute ACTAR scores, all the cesarean birth measures that we're interested in today, but other things like hemorrhage and preeclampsia and so forth. Hospitals that are enrolled in the data center can then uh, monitor their rates of these things in real time. They can make peer comparisons, so they can actually compare themselves to other hospitals who are enrolled in the data center. They can even drill down to provider variation and see how individual providers are doing on these measures. And this then helps identify quality improvement opportunities. So this is just sort of like the tip of the iceberg what the maternal data center can do, but it's a big reason why California has been successful in all of these quality improvement endeavors. So here's the, the model of how CMTCC creates change. Essentially, uh, they take that info from the data center, combine it with evidence-based support tools, which are the toolkits, combined also with um, engaging hospital clinicians and administrators, or basically the mentorships that CMTCC provides, uh, and through that, hopefully, improves maternity care. So today, we're going to be talking specifically about one portion of this, which is the cesarean toolkit. So let's begin with a test. Most of you will probably get this uh, test question correct. Um, nonetheless, I think it's important to, to start out with this. This was in uh, the New York Times in January of this year. So you are about to give birth. Pregnancy has gone smoothly. The birth seems as if it will too. It's one baby in the right position, full term, and you've never had a cesarean section. In other words, you're at low risk for complications. What is likely to be the biggest influence on whether you will have a C-section? Is it your personal wishes, your choice of hospital, your baby's weight, your baby's heart rate and labor, or the progress of your labor? And in fact, it is your choice of hospital that is likely to be the biggest influence on whether you will have a cesarean. So that's why we're all here today, so that we can hopefully improve upon that. First of all, let's talk about why the toolkit focuses on maliparous term single pin vertex cesarean birth, which is a mouthful of what we can say first birth cesarean. Um, and while the toolkit does focus on that, I do want to say, though, that the, the guidelines we present are really applicable to almost every woman giving birth. But nonetheless, we had to focus on the NPSC population. And here's why. First of all, Here's a screenshot from uh, a study that was released back in 2000, uh, 2013, showing that cesarean delivery rates among uh, U.S. hospitals varied tenfold. In California, we see pretty much the same kind of variation. This is the total cesarean rate, I believe, in 2014 across California hospitals. Some hospitals having a rate as low as 15% total cesarean rate in one as high as 75% total cesarean rate. I think one of the biggest criticisms or comments we get when we compare cesarean rates across providers and groups is that, for example, many providers will say, but wait, you know, I, I only see high-risk folks. Um, and hospitals will say this as well. You know, we are the tertiary center that's 
for the region and everybody comes to us and we take what we get and of course our cesarean rates would be, be higher than the next hospital. So for that reason there, we had to uh, design a way to adjust for risk, right? And that's where NOI parity becomes very important. So NOI parity is a critical risk adjuster and it creates a standardized population uh, that can be compared across providers, hospitals, and states. Um, for example, you know, in California, there are there's some hospitals that have a NOI parity rate as high as 60%, and some hospitals that have a NOI parity rate as low as 20%. If you're comparing those hospitals to each other and looking at overall cesarean rate or primary cesarean rate, um, the hospitals that have higher rates of NOI parity are going to appear to have higher cesarean rates because those are the, the harder and the longer births, right? So important to get rid of those multiples out of the correct equation and focus only on noise parity. Secondly, the NTSB, or at least the term singleton vertex part, represents the most favorable conditions for vaginal birth. Um, but because of the noise parity, also the most difficult labor management. But this is good because it helps focus quality improvement efforts on labor management. And I think what's most striking about the NTSB rates is that the NTSB population is in fact the largest contributor to the recent rise in cesarean rates. And also the NTSB population exhibits the greatest variation for all subpopulations of cesarean births for both hospitals and providers. But what's also important, I mean, we just talked about the sort of geeky data stuff of why uh, first birth is important, but really there's um, much more to, to it in that, um, you know, if a woman has a cesarean birth, in the first labor, over 90% of all subsequent births will be cesarean. And the same goes for vaginal births. If she has a vaginal birth in that first labor, over 90% of all subsequent will be vaginal births. So we feel as providers and nurses that we have a real mandate, a real a responsibility to protect that first vaginal birth where possible. Okay, so uh, let's get back to looking at the variation across California hospitals if we're only looking at the noliferous term singleton vertex rate. And you can see even when we adjust for risk, there's still a wide variation across the, straight, uh, the state. Uh, one hospital as low as 12% NTSD cesarean rate and one hospital as high as 70%. Um, the California average is about 26.1%. Uh, so 40% of California hospitals meet the national target and 60% can improve. And the national target, by the way, is 23.9%. Uh, as set forth by the Healthy People 2020 goal. So wherever there is large variation, we know that there's definitely a uh, chance for improving. But we also know that there's an improvement opportunity because the data shows uh, recently what exactly are the indications that are driving the rise in this area. And the, those indications are labor complications, uh, like failure to progress, CPD, and fetal intolerance of labor. So this is important because these two things are provider-dependent diagnoses, or essentially they rely on provider discretion. And anytime there's a lot of discretion involved, we know that we can improve upon them. So we've talked about the variation, um, but why really should we care about the cesarean rates? Well, for one thing, there's been a steady rise since the 70s without uh, any Anyway, without any maternal and neonatal benefit. It was as low as 6% in the early 70s, up to 20% in the 80s, and then by 2010 was a third of all births. And cerebral palsy rates have essentially remained unchanged during that time. I think this is probably a better slide to show just exactly how the cesarean rate spiked over the years between about 1997 and 2010 there. You can see a sharp increase in the cesarean rate, in fact, an increase by about 50%. The U.S. and California in 2013 were pretty much mirror images of each other with cesareans accounting for a third of all births across the nation. And this makes cesarean birth the most common hospital surgery in the United States. So uh, there are also uh, large maternal and infant risks, and they include on the acute end for maternal risks, things like longer hospital stays, delayed and difficult breastfeeding, pain and fatigue, 
some much more um, complicated things like anesthesia complications, postpartum hemorrhage, wound infection, DVT, and so forth. But it's really the long-term and subsequent cesarean bursts that pose the risk, including abnormal placentation and a stepwise increase in life-threatening hemorrhage. In fact, we know that by the third cesarean, the risk for placenta previa nearly triples. And that 40% of those women with a previa will have an accreta. So that's where that stepwise increase in life threatening hemorrhage comes in. And then there's other things like uterine rupture, surgical adhesion, bowel injury, bowel obstruction, and delayed interval from incision to birth, which can pose a neonatal risk. The data now shows that also there might be some psychological risks for women, including the acute risk of um, ineffective bonding and maternal anxiety. And then long-term risks, including postpartum depression and even PTSD. Neonatal risks of cesarean birth include impaired neonatal respiratory function, uh, increased NICU admissions. Uh, in December of last year, a report came out showing the increased risk of childhood asthma requiring inhaler use and hospitalization for babies born by scheduled cesarean birth. Um, and it also affects the maternal newborn interaction and breastfeeding. In most places, the cesarean birth um, restricts that golden hour of skin to skin contact, and in many cases, completely removes that golden hour of skin to skin contact. And that can really affect breastfeeding success. And of course, as a public health person, I can't help but mention the cost of cesareans, as you know, high value care is really quality over cost. And we know that in California, we could save 80 to $441 million per year simply by reducing unnecessary cesarean births. And up until this point, cesarean birth um, reduction has really been quite difficult. Um, and I'm not going to read off all of these here, but just suffice it to say that there are many complex factors that have impeded um, cesarean reduction thus far. Um, but I feel, and I'm happy to say that I think we're finally at a tipping point where we can finally make some change. Um, just the amount of folks that signed up for this webinar goes to show that. We posted this on Monday, and by Tuesday we had almost 400 people that had registered. So I think that timing is, is perfect, and we could use it to our advantage to work towards um, cesarean reduction. One thing I want to bring up, though, is that it's not just the toolkit and similar toolkits that will bring this about, but rather um, lots of folks have to be involved. In fact, there are many elephants in the room, so to speak, um, that the toolkit talks about briefly, but definitely deserve more attention, like um, liability and risk and how providers feel about liability and risk and having to decrease their cesarean rates. Payment reform is a big one, provider willingness to change, hospital willingness to change, and so forth. So in order to tackle all these things, all these folks have to be at the table, including insurers, and employers, public advocates, consumers, Medicaid people, professional organizations, and then, of course, hospital providers and data-driven QI projects, which is what we are talking about today. Uh, but that's probably the most important thing, because if hospitals and providers don't change, um, there is no starting point, right? Okay, so let's get to the toolkit. So the CMQCC toolkit uh, is a comprehensive evidence-based how-to guide to reduce primary cesarean delivery in the MTSD population. Uh, and uh, it is now the, the foundational resource for the collaborative that is going on in Southern California right now and will be extended across the state later this year or early next year. <coughs> Uh, like I said before, the principles are generalizable to all women giving birth, even though the focus is the MTSC population. And it has a companion implementation guide that can be downloaded on the website. The writing group consisted of over 50 expert writers and advisors. The writing group included obstetricians, CMMs, registered nurses, educators, doulas, hospital leaders, public health folks, uh, public policy folks who really kind of left no stone unturned. The advisory group uh, consisted of the same types of professions, but also included people who represented ACOG, A1, ACNM, SOAP, and others. The key foundational materials for the toolkit are, uh, one is the obstetric care consensus statement for the safe prevention of the primary, uh, primary cesarean delivery that was released back in March 2014 and also the National AIM bundle, patient safety bundle for the safe reduction of primary cesarean births. 
Um, for those who aren't aware, AIM is uh, the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health. It's part of the Council on Patient Safety, which is made up of ACOG and AWAN and AAFP and others um, who have created over the years various patient safety bundles um, that act as blueprints or roadmaps, uh, evidence-based practices that when performed together should hopefully improve patient outcomes. So our toolkit is um, modeled very heavily after this bundle. So first, a couple of caveats. Um, when using a toolkit, you pick the right tool for the job. And we bring that up because um, we don't want anyone to believe that we have designed sort of a cookie cutter method for cesarean reduction at your facility. Rather, we are hoping that each facility will choose what works for them, what the, find out what your needs are, and then choose the appropriate tools that, that match those needs. And then secondly, um, we do not want to just sort of go about cesarean reduction really know it. Obviously, cesareans are really important and are life-saving procedures that prevent fetal and maternal harm. What we want to do, however, is reduce unnecessary cesareans, and hopefully the tools in the toolkit will help providers and nurses and administrators make those decisions more effective. So like I said uh, just a couple minutes ago, is that our toolkit is based on the AIM bundle. Most bundles for quality improvement these days have a standardized layout of the four R's, which are readiness, recognition and prevention, response, and reporting. So I'm going to go through each of these sections in the toolkit now. So the first section, readiness. Readiness for cesarean reduction really refers to developing a maternity culture that values and supports intended vaginal birth. So while I generally don't want to read through a slide bullet by bullet, I am going to do that when we talk about the strategies in each section. Um, that's important because when this project started a year ago, um, the writing group got together over the course of a weekend and we came up with lists and lists and lists of all the strategies that could potentially reduce this area. And from there, various meetings later, we pared down that list and we pared it down even more and finally got to what we believe to be the most important strategies in each section in order to reduce this area. Um, but sometimes we get comments on like, well, what about this? What about that? For example, obesity. What if we got obesity under control? That would really help with cesarean section rates. Well, that's kind of more of a more uh, upstream public health indicator. And we really wanted to focus on clinical strategies that can be introduced in facilities right now. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so the strategies to improve readiness. Uh, one is to improve access and quality to modern childbirth education, improve shared decision-making at critical points in care, bridge the provider knowledge and skills gap, harness the power of clinical champions, and transition from paying for value, volume excuse me, to paying for value, so essentially payment reform. And here are some examples of tools in the toolkit for those strategies. Uh, we have links to sources of best childbirth education, tools and policies and concepts of what makes a mother-friendly hospital, and approaches to shared decision-making um, and how to train uh, providers and nurses in, in shared decision-making. This is a screenshot to just short, sort of show you how the toolkit tools are laid out. Uh, so for example, some tools are immediately available to you in the appendix. You can see they're down at the bottom. It says CMQCC Birth Preferences Guide. That's available in Appendix E. While the other tools there are available by web link that leads to publicly available information on the internet. And these links have been vetted by us. We've done the research for you and have simply made it really easy to have those links at your fingertips depending on what tool you need. Here's one example of what we talk about in the writing section is shared decision making, which uh, we hope will become, uh, will replace informed consent in years to come. Um, specifically for shared decision making, the writing group realized that there are specific patient decision points that impact the risk of cesarean. But oftentimes patients don't know that those choices could impact their risk. And that includes things like the choice of facility or provider for their uh, care at the time of birth, the timing of admission to the hospital, like, you know, for example, admission in early labor carries with it an increased risk of cesarean, 
choice of fetal monitoring method, continuous versus intermittent, whether to have continuous labor support by a trained caregiver like a doula, and induction of labor without a medical indication. So to that end, we um, created for you in Appendix E the birth preferences worksheet, uh, also <laughs> better known as the birth plan. Now, birth plans have really, I think, gotten a bad rap over the years, uh, but we believe that the birth plan can be a valuable way that providers and patients can engage in shared decision-making, specifically as it relates to those patient decision points that affect cesarean birth. And so we took a lot of a lot of different birth plans and chose the ones that we liked the best and then from those pulled out the things we liked the best and included them in, in one birth preferences worksheet for your convenience. And that is available in the toolkit. So those are just a, a few things in the readiness section that is available to you. Let's move on now to recognition and prevention. And what recognition and prevention means for cesarean reduction is really supporting intended vaginal birth. The strategies for supporting intended vaginal birth include implementing institutional policies that support vaginal birth and the physiologic processes and reduce routine intervention, implementing early labor policies for admission and supportive care, improving supportive care overall by nurses and doulas and uh, through how the, the equipment you have on the unit and the infrastructure of the unit, uh, implementing best practices for regional anesthesia, intermittent monitoring for low-risk women, and implementing protocols for modifiable conditions like HSV and breech position, um, which are a small portion of the population, but still important to talk about. So some examples of the tools in the toolkit include model policies for early labor support, intermittent monitoring, freedom of movement policies. We include the coping with labor algorithm directly in the appendix. We give guidelines for working with doulas. Uh, as well as links to patient education and decision guides. So in talking about prevention of unnecessary cesarean, I think we have to acknowledge that in this country there is certainly an overuse of certain OB interventions, which has led to, you know, the coining of the phrase, the cascade of intervention, which includes the routine use of oxytocin, continuous fetal monitoring, routine induction of labor, and so forth. And I think we can all agree that the overuse of these interventions may prevent uh, normal physiologic processes from occurring and therefore potentially inhibit normal birth, which is why this joint statement is so important. It's a joint statement by the AAP and A1 and ACNM and ACOG, which says, pregnancy and birth are physiologic processes unique for each woman that usually proceed normally. Most women have normal conception, fetal growth, labor and birth, and require minimal to no intervention in the process. So the first thing in um, respecting the normal physiologic process is understanding that the physiologic onset of labor is critical to the to success of labor, and it introduces moms and babies to protective hormonal pathways. We know that women who are admitted in early labor are more likely to have a cesarean and more likely to have routine interventions such as oxytocin, even if not clinically necessary. So what this means is we should really be helping women to complete early labor at home and letting labor start on its own. And obviously there will be some exceptions to this, but hopefully this, this should be for the majority of women. So to that end in the toolkit, we've provided uh, lots of tools to support this, including algorithms for spontaneous labor and recommendations for active labor admission policies, um, how to support latent labor if admitted, and uh, therapeutic rest as an alternative to admission. Uh, patient education materials to explain the rationale for delayed admission and uh, reduce anxiety for them, as well as specific guidance for partners and families on what they can do to, to get through the early labor period at home. Here's a screenshot of one of the links we provide, which is the Safe Deliveries Roadmap, um, which is from the Washington State Hospital Association, and they provide a great little booklet on um, uh, that establishes criteria for active labor admission. And then here we see a couple other screenshots of those links to patient resources to help support early labor. And there's just a couple, but there are many, many links there for, for patient support. Okay. 
So moving on to improving labor support. Labor support is a huge component of supporting intended vaginal birth. In fact, the ability to improve comfort and decrease anxiety according to each patient's distinct preference is fundamental to promoting labor progress and preventing dysfunctional labor. The data now uh, is very clear on the benefits of continuous labor support. Um, for our purposes today, women with continuous labor support are less likely to have a cesarean birth. And there's other advantages as well, like a slightly shorter labor, uh, less likely to need a vacuum or forceps delivery. Babies uh, also benefit um, in that they are less likely to have a low five-minute APGAR score. But I think it's safe to say in this day and age that nurses are not able to provide continuous, like literally continuous labor support, right? I think we'd be hard pressed to find any nurse that could walk into a labor room at the start of his or her shift and stay there until they leave or until their shift is over. So because of that, we really have to think about relying on experts whose sole job is to give continuous labor support. And that leads us to this concept of doing. Um, so traditionally, I, at least I can speak from my experience, I think there's been some tension between doulas and the hospital setting. Sometimes that tension is on the part of the doula, sometimes that tension is on the part of the nurse. Um, so the toolkit hopes to give some guidance on how to improve upon that. Um, here's a direct quote uh, from the ACOG Obstetric Care Consensus. It says, published data indicates that one of the most effective tools, I'll say that again, the most effective tools to improve labor and delivery outcomes is the continuous presence of support personnel, such as the doula. Given that there are no associated measurable harms, this resource is probably underutilized. Um, and it, I think we can say that it is, in fact, underutilized. Now, this does not preclude nurses from being better at labor support, right? So the toolkit has an entire large section dedicated to how we can improve labor support, including talking about uh, freedom of movement in labor, how mobility and upright and ambulatory positioning is really important. We talk at length about non-pharmacologic comfort measures that are beneficial to every woman, not just women who don't have an epidural, but to every woman. Um, also, the use of certain techniques and tools that can facilitate fetal rotation and flexion and descent, especially for women with epidural anesthesia. Um, positioning and exercises uh, to, um, to help with fetal rotation and so forth, and then intermittent monitoring or telemetry if continuous monitoring is necessary. Uh, also, this, the, the physical environment also has to support labor. So we can support labor all we want as, as nurses and providers, but if the physical environment isn't conducive to labor support, it really won't work. So the, the toolkit goes through what is, what is really key to uh, a supportive physical environment. So here's an example of one of the appendices in the toolkit. This is the coping with labor algorithm, which is directly available in the appendix. We hope that the coping with labor algorithm will replace the standard numeric pain scale. Uh, the standard numeric pain scale is um, really not appropriate for labor because it focused on abnormal pain. And we know that pain and labor is a normal thing. Um, although, you know, we are in no way saying that we want women to stay in pain, but rather um, if we apply a coping versus non-coping approach to pain management, I think we'll be able to better support and provide comfort measures that attend to women's anxiety and pain while also uh, promoting normal physiologic processes. Also in this section is implementing intermittent monitoring for low-risk patients. We know that continuous monitoring increases the likelihood of cesarean. It has not been shown to improve neonatal outcomes, uh, for example, by reducing rates of cerebral palsy. It also restricts movement, and mobility is really important to the normal physiologic process and also important for coping. And continuous monitoring may potentially reduce the nursing interaction and the labor support given. So here are some screenshots of what's available in the toolkit to help with this. Uh, on the left side there, you can see that we have a whole list of components of a successful intermittent monitoring program and what needs to happen. On the bottom there is a screenshot of a model policy for intermittent monitoring and intermittent auscultation. And on the right there, you can see a screenshot of um, exclusion criteria 
for intermittent monitoring. Uh, in most places, uh, continuous monitoring is the default method of monitoring, and it requires a provider order in order to intermittently monitor the patient. We hope that intermittent monitoring will become the default method um, and that it would require a provider order to continuously monitor a patient. Um, and we think that if nurses are provided with the appropriate policies and procedures, as well as these exclusion criteria, that that should be fairly straightforward to implement. In this section, we also talk about epidural and preventing fetal malposition. So there, uh, while there's no evidence that epidurals cause malposition, we do know that women with epidurals are up to four times as likely to have an OP fetus. Uh, and those with an OP fetus are two to six times more likely to have a cesarean birth. So the toolkit gives techniques and tools to assist the labor nurse in preventing malposition. So the epiduralized patient, for example, through positioning in the first stage, um, pushing positions in second stage for fetuses who are persistently malpositioned, um, and then use of tools such as uh, the peanut ball, for example, which is becoming more popular these days to um, help rotate babies in epidural education and prevent this area. All right, so we're just getting right through it. Uh, so now the response section, which is really about management of labor abnormality. And strategies for the appropriate management of labor abnormality include creating highly reliable teams and improving interdisciplinary communication, adopting standard measures for labor dystocia and fetal heart rate abnormality, utilizing operative vaginal deliveries in appropriate cases, identifying malposition and performing manual rotation if possible, uh, considering alternative coverage programs like labor models and collaborative practice models with nurse midwives. Uh, developing systems that facilitate safe, efficient transfer of care from the out of hospital environment, and also to not practice defensively, but rather to focus on quality and safety. And so this section probably has, the response section has the most tools in the toolkit. And some examples here include things like spontaneous labor algorithms, dystocia checklists, uh, induction of labor alg algorithms and policies for timing and appropriate scheduling for induction of labor, algorithms for standard intervention for fetal heart rate changes, uh, model policies for safe use of oxytocin, oxytocin and tools for effective communication. And here's just some screenshots of tools in this section. These are just three screens that there's much more than this in the, in the response section, in fact. Um, which makes sense that we would um, have the most tools considering what we talked about previously uh, in that labor dystocia and fetal heart rate abnormalities account for the largest drivers in the increase in cesarean rates. Um, so we want to spend some time uh, with designing tools to help improve care. So uh, the, the writing group, uh, there's a lot to go through in the response section, so I'm just going to sort of focus on a couple of things. One of that is that there are four specific areas that the writing group determined uh, that standardization and care can, can excuse me, standardization can significantly improve care. Um, I do want to say though, we're not talking about standardizing every single response to what happens on the labor and delivery unit with abnormalities that can occur. Um, labor and birth is obviously a dynamic process. Uh, changes occur rapidly. Every situation is different. Uh, we also have to personalize care for each mother and baby. Um, so perfect standardization is not possible, and that's not what we are asking for. But rather, we're saying that there are certain uh, standardized definitions that can be used to guide care. So first of all, I'm going to look at diagnosis of labor dystocia. I think we have a lot of tools for that in the toolkit. And then I'll, I'll touch upon briefly um, some tools for abnormal heart rate patterns and induction of labor. So first, let's look at diagnosis of labor dystocia. So uh, it is really easy to over-diagnose labor dystocia if we aren't adhering to the new guidelines for the length of labor. Um, and that is why uh, close to half of the recommendations in the ACOG obstetric care consensus uh, as it pertains to first and second stage and induction of labor really have to do with having greater clinical patients. Specifically, slow but progressive labor 
in the first stage is not an indication for cesarean, nor is a prolonged latent phase as defined by Friedman previously. We've also heard the phrase fixes the new four that kind of came out of Dr. Zang's work in the Consortium on Safe Labor. Um, truly now six is really the, the start of active labor, five to six centimeters is the start. We really should not be applying um, active labor criteria to women who aren't there yet. Also longer pushing times may be necessary for women with epidural or a malpositioned fetus. So we have a lot of tools in the toolkit that can help um, providers and nurses um, more effectively diagnose dystocia. Uh, here is a screenshot of the CMQCC labor dystocia checklist, which comes straight from the ACOG criteria uh, for first stage arrest and second stage arrest and failed induction. This is located in Appendix K of the toolkit. Here's an example of an induction of labor algorithm for, uh, found, uh, I think, in Appendix R of the toolkit. And this walks you through induction of labor and when it truly does become a failed induction. Here's one of my favorites, uh, Appendix J, which is a pre-cesarean checklist for labor dystocia. Um, this was designed by one of the pilot hospitals, Miller's Women and Children's Hospital, as kind of a, a bit of a hard stop for when a cesarean is being performed. Basically, it requires the provider to uh, decide on the diagnosis, whether it's failed induction or latent phase arrest, active phase of arrest, and so forth, and then to mark uh, the criteria that the patient meets in order to, to really effectively make this diagnosis. We also include an active labor cardiogram, which uh, was kind of a co-venture with Swedish Hospital in Seattle. Uh, it's a linear-based cardiogram that, um, however, includes the, uh, the new definitions for length of labor. And this makes it really easy to see when a woman is beginning to fall off the curve and when a cesarean delivery is necessary. And now moving on to some other topics. Here's one example, a screenshot of uh, interpartum fetal heart rate algorithm. We also include Dr. Clark's algorithm for management of category two tracings directly in the toolkit. And there's lots of model policies, and this one particularly is a model policy for uh, induction of labor and labor uh, induction of labor scheduling. And other policies include things like safe use of oxytocin. Also, we discuss in this section management of malposition. We talk about it briefly in part two in terms of how nurses can prevent malposition in the epiduralized patient. But in the response section, we have an entire appendix um, devoted to second stage management of malposition. All right, now moving on to reporting and systems learning, or essentially using data to drive improvement. Strategies for using data to drive improvement include providing timely feedback in a persuasive manner, using comparative data which conveys a sense of urgency, presenting data for both hospital and providers, uh, setting achievable goals, and then tying this cold data with patient stories and other successes. This section also talks about how to engage women and employers and the general public in the improvement project because we know that consumers play a really big role in quality improvement and that they are an integral part of the positive feedback cycle. When women know uh, where quality care is being delivered, they will seek out those providers and those facilities. So the reporting section um, gives information on how to do this, how to publicly release, publicly release your information, um, how to provide a lay explanation of those measures and to widely distribute those measures through multiple media channels in order to capture the best attention. All right, so is real change possible? We know there are some hospitals that have low rates and others with high rates of cesarean, but is it possible to take hospitals with high rates of cesarean and quickly and successfully lower their rates? And the answer is yes. Um, prior to starting this toolkit, there were three pilot hospitals in 2014 who informed the development of the toolkit. And uh, that was a joint venture with the Pacific Business Group on Health and CMQCC and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And the three hospitals chosen were Hogue Hospital, Miller and Children's Hospital, and Saddleback Memorial Medical Center, all in Southern California where the highest rates of cesarean exist in the state. Um, these hospitals were chosen because they had um, higher than normal NTSV cesarean rates. 
they also had fairly, fairly large volume of deliveries. But in addition to that, they also had strong leadership, readiness to engage in the project. Um, and interestingly, there were also employers in the Southern California region who were expressing concerns about the large number of employees in their firms or businesses that were going to these facilities and ending up with cesarean births. And they were wondering if that was normal and how we could go about changing that. So sort of like all, all the right things were in place to use these hospitals as a pilot project. Pilot project. And so here's what the project components were. Uh, they all received data measurement support through the maternal data center, uh, combined with quality improvement support, or especially the mentoring from CMQCC to help them um, to design and devise tools and processes specific to their hospital. And then a small portion of it was also peer form. And what we saw were some pretty impressive results. Um, we can see here that amongst the three, an average 20% reduction in their NPSC cesarean rate. And it happened very quickly, and it also has continued to be sustained at those, those facilities. I like this slide here because it, it shows just how quickly it happened. This is one of the facilities. You can see the QI project started in January of 2014. They had sort of a baseline around 30 to 32% NPSC cesarean. By March 2014, it had been reduced to 24.3%. Uh, and then by May of that year, so within about five months, uh, it was below the national target. So provider level cesarean rates. Uh, at each of these facilities, a really important part of this was um, releasing provider level cesarean rates. At first, in department meetings, these rates were blinded to providers, but they could kind of compare between. Um, and then over time, they unblinded them so that each provider could see collectively where they stood in comparison to other providers. And this probably had one of the biggest effects on uh, reducing cesarean rates at these facilities very quickly. One of the questions always is, if maternal outcomes are improved, how does that affect neonatal outcomes? And you can see from this slide, uh, this is the rate of unexpected newborn complications at one of the facilities, but they were all like this, essentially. Um, <clears throat> the purple line there is uh, the California rate of unexpected newborn complications, 3.8%. The hospital before the start of the QI project had a rate well below that, and they continued to have a rate well below that during the intervention period. Um, so babies were fine. And so the take-home lessons from these pilot hospitals uh, were that there is quite a lot of power in providing provider-level data, especially unblinded provider-level data. There is a key role for nurses, especially in labor support. Uh, there needs to be a reason to change, and a lot of times that comes from being able to compare your facility to other facilities and um, providers to other providers. National guidelines are very helpful in guiding this process. It's obviously something that needs constant gardening. This is not an endeavor that you can start and feel like will be done two years from now. This is something that will be ongoing. Um, and obviously medical and nursing leadership is very, very important. Now, we've gone through the entirety of the toolkit and why cesarean reduction is important. And at this point, you're probably wondering, uh, what do we do now? Where do we start? Uh, so Julie Vasher, who introduced this call, as well as Kim Wachmeister, who's uh, also introducing the collaborative across the state, uh, helped to design the implementation guide for this toolkit. Um, and this is such an important document because it contains basics of quality improvement, leadership um, concepts to quality improvement, and then most important, where and how to start. And it's available for download on the CMQCC site right next to the toolkit. There's just a screenshot of one of the things in the implementation guide, the readiness assessment. Tried to, you can see uh, where you fare in terms of being ready to start uh, an endeavor like this and what you need to focus on. And probably my favorite part of this are the, is the top 10 list. Uh, lots of times people ask, well, if I had to do just a few things, what would be like most important things to get this? started in my facility and to be successful at it. And they've created a top 10 list of everything that would be necessary according to each of the sections of the toolkit. 
won't need to read these. You can see it really guides the top 10 things you can do to get started. All right. And then the next step would be for a California hospital, if not already a member, to uh, discuss participating in the Maternal Data Center. And there's a, a email there for Ann Castle uh, who directs the data center. Uh, download the implementation guide that I just spoke about and evaluate your readiness. Um, also evaluate your own processes, audit 20 charts, and for example, see if, um, if, you, if those charts are for labor dystocia, if they actually meet the requirements for labor dystocia, or take 20 charts and see uh, what are the most common diagnoses at your facility for cesarean and start from there. Um, if you're interested in joining the collaborative, because the statewide collaborative will be taking off fairly soon, um, you can contact Kim Workmeister at that email there. Any questions about the toolkit can be emailed directly to Nancy Peterson, who's also on the call today. All right, so that's it for the presentation. Thank you so much for listening. We'll go ahead and see if Julie received any questions. Thank you, Holly. Um, I know that was a lot of information, um, but Holly presented it so nice and clear. Um, I'm sure we're all very um, appreciative of that. Um, if you haven't um, downloaded the toolkit, you can see um, all of the great tools and resources that are available for you. Um, I'm just looking now to see if we have any questions in the chat box. There we go. We do. Let me run down some of these. Um, and, and I just want to um, bring Nancy Peterson in on the call so that she can respond as well. Um, I'm trying again. You're on, Nancy. I unmuted you. You're okay. okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, Nancy, do you want to look down the questions and then you and Holly can um, answer them? You know what, Julie? I'm actually not seeing them on mine. Let me see here. Go to. Oh, wait, sorry. No, no, I found them. Okay. 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 So, there is one question about does the toolkit still apply to NOLIP women with pre existing medical uh, problems such as diabetes, hypertension, high BMIs, et cetera? And I would have to say, um, you know, that while this toolkit is really focused on um, low risk women, um, I think that, you know, for many of the high risk women, as we all know, um, there is a medical indication for a cesarean. However, for those that may be induced and potentially have an option, um, I think many of the tools and strategies in the toolkit can be beneficial for them to actually improve their chances of a successful vaginal delivery. So I do think that, you know, many of the, we made it very, um, you know, uh, since the, a big focus is on labor support, um, all of those things, regardless if they end up with a section, can be really beneficial to decrease their anxiety and improve their birth experience. So I would say definitely um, it would be beneficial for them. I don't know, Holly, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I agree. I mean, certainly there are some women who are high risk enough that certain tools in the toolkit don't apply, like intermittent monitoring, for example. But those same women, the, the algorithms we provide for um, fetal heart rate monitoring and um, uh, length of labor and so far, all, all that stuff still applies. So yeah, I think it, it's still applicable. Right. Um, lots of questions about will the recording be available on the website and the slides, and uh, yes, um, the slides will be coming uh, onto the website very soon, and the tool, uh, this webinar will be recorded and archived and available um, for you to listen to um, as many times as you'd like or to uh, also uh, send the link off to some of your um, staff members. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's a question about have you developed a baseline practice assessment to be used with RNs and OB providers in hospitals before they begin to work um, to determine baseline practices? And yes, that readiness survey will, will really help you identify where your hospital is at and um, help you focus on what strategies might be the most beneficial for you. Um, and this I don't know, Julie. Julie. Yeah, yeah, say. yeah, sure. Thanks, Nance. Um, yeah, uh, there is a readiness assessment, as Holly and Nancy have talked about, in the implementation guide. Um, and from that, you can um, kind of perform a gap analysis on your unit as to what needs to be in place in order to be successful. And also, Holly alluded to those um, top ten. They, we really just took 
you know, kind of a bite out of the big toolkit to, to help you get started. In the implementation guide, there's also a timeline on how you can get started and what you can expect to accomplish in month one, month two, et cetera. It is geared toward the collaborative, but it can be used um, in anybody's practice. And it does ta also refer to some of these baseline assessments. So, okay, thank you, Nance. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, this question for you, Holly. Um, do you have any comments on the role of midwives in reducing primary cesareans? Yes. Um, so there is actually an entire section related to midwifery care and the philosophy of midwifery care. Um, there was a recent study released, I think, probably in March of this year that looked at States where midwives were utilized more had a, a lower rate of cesarean birth. And I think that's because we have a real understanding and respect for the normal physiologic process. Um, and that is, is not to say that midwives aren't, cannot be sort of more medical providers when we need to be. Certainly we can. But I think our philosophy of care it, uh, really supports the endeavor to reduce cesarean birth. And we give um, uh, recommendations in the toolkit for things like uh, midwife labor and collaborative practice with midwives. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, so there's a question um, about doulas. Um, uh, there's one from uh, a doula in Houston, um, and she uh, said that she's starting an organization that provides doula support to low-income birthing people. Um, how would you suggest I try to get something like this implemented here where some, um, some cesarean rates are over 30 percent and we have the second best VBAC hospital? Uh, um, I would say probably meeting with key stakeholders first, with um, the sites that you are involved in, the hospitals that you attend birth in with patients sort of meeting with those provide, uh, uh, administrators and providers first and sort of getting it on their radar about the toolkit and that yours can be a big part of cesarean reduction. Um, I would say start there because I think um, once they get into the toolkit and they see how well it's laid out and um, just have the, the argument, the really good argument that's made for doula support might get, might get the ball rolling. Additionally, yeah, um, that, Nancy? Uh, yeah, I was just going to mention, additionally, um, if you can wait or you get some things going in January, we have two of our um, doulas from our task force are going to provide a webinar on how you can start a doula practice in your hospital and how to get that ball rolling and improve those relationships. And that information will be available on our website very soon. Uh, let's see. Trying to scan some of these. There's a lot of duplication. Let's see. Uh, and and the toolkit we talked about in the beginning. There, the toolkit is available, um, and there is no charge. There's just a very brief. Um, uh, survey, sorry about that, registration survey that um, just kind of helps us understand who's downloading the toolkit, but then it's no charge. Um, Holly, um, how about yeah. this one? Hi, what did you mean by don't practice defensively? Example, what do you mean by that? Oh, um, yes. Yeah. So um, it's kind of a big section that it couldn't really uh, fit into the webinar, but uh, risk and liability is a, a big question for providers and nurses when we talk about cesarean reduction. Um, and people are worried that, you know, if they begin to have to reduce their cesarean rate, how is this going to affect their liability? Um, so that was a really uh, important part of the toolkit, and essentially what it came down to um, is focusing on quality and safety, and we give some recommendations how to um, uh, make that your focus instead of worry about liability. Um, there's a question that I think is an, a very good one uh, about we already have a fairly low C-section rate, um, about 18 percent, which is fabulous, but there's always room for improvement. What do you think is the best thing to focus on? Ah, um, 
well, if your rate is already that low, that's amazing. And you should publicize that to your <laughs> provider's services and let them know they're doing a really good job. Um, I would say that you really need to do a chart review and see um, where your, uh, what diagnoses you are making that lead to cesarean birth. Um, the, the top things that people could work on clinically are things like um, decreasing early elective delivery before 41 weeks, uh, improving labor support, um, improving response to fetal heart rate abnormalities, um, decreasing early labor admissions, uh, decreasing routine interventions. So those are sort of like the big clinical picture that everybody could work on. So I would start by probably doing a chart review, seeing where your, uh, why you're doing the most cesareans and, and work on that. All right, um, there's a question here for you and Holly and Nancy. It says, could you speak to the evidence surrounding elective induction of labor at 39 weeks? It was discussed at ACOG's annual meeting that routine elective induction of labor at 39 weeks would decrease perinatal deaths without increase in cesarean section rates. <laughs> uh, hmm. I don't, Nancy, did you get that? Repeat the question for me. Or? Yeah. There's a question. It says, could you speak to the evidence surrounding elective uh, induction of labor at 39 weeks? It was discussed at ACOG's annual meeting that routine elective inductions at 39 weeks would decrease perinatal deaths without increasing the C-section rates. Uh, you can go up there. Did you want to take that one, Nancy? Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, I mean, obviously, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, ev new evidence coming out, and there's uh, certainly a lot of, uh, we, I mean, we didn't really address that in our toolkit per se, um, and, you know, I, I wasn't at ACOG's meeting to really, um, uh, to hear all the discussion that was surrounding that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think any time uh, pregnancy extends longer, right, there's always that chance for mm -hmm. uh, increased perinatal death as you get closer to 40 to 41 weeks. But I think also ACOG has made it really clear that really there should be a medical indication in order to induce labor if a patient is less than 41 weeks. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. There's a couple questions on here about measures and joining the collaborative. Um, if you would like to contact me offline, I'll be happy to share that with you. It's a little um, um, tricky to talk about with this national audience. So you can email me at jvasher at cmqcc.org, and I'll be happy to respond to that. Great. Let's see. I think also, um, you know, I'm thinking about this induction of labor question. Um, you know, sometimes the point is made that after 39 weeks, if there isn't such a great risk to babies and moms and potentially don't have a risk of cesarean with induction of labor, um, why aren't we just doing it? Um, and one of the points that Elliot Main like, likes to make is that um, induction differs from facility to facility and from provider to provider. Um, and if providers aren't patient enough for induction of labor, you may see in those facilities that they actually do have um, a higher cesarean rate with uh, patients who are induced. Um, so I can say that although we didn't tackle this specific question in the toolkit, we did talk a bit about how every provider can in, uh, be more patient during the induction of labor process uh, in order to reduce cesarean birth. Um, while adhering to the guidelines, the ACOG guidelines that say that really we shouldn't be doing it without a medical indication at less than 41 weeks. Right. There's another question about um, we have a low overall rate in our state. It's about 20 and a half uh, percent, but we have wide variation between facilities, so we're going to focus on those facilities with higher rates. And um, yeah, I have to say that that's definitely what we've seen. But even within facilities, one facility, you'll see a wide vari variation rate between providers. And that's where, you know, there was such good success with our pilot hospitals in once they were able to show, um, even blinded initially, the data to see this huge variation in providers that essentially have the same risk 
uh, patients or the same group of patients that they see, um, it really became very clear that uh, there are certainly things that each provider can do to improve their C-section rate. So um, I think, you know, you will see a huge variation within facilities even in the same, you know, down the street from each other that are dealing with the same group of patients. So that's great. Holly, here's even a question. Amongst providers. Oh. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. sorry. I was just saying, even amongst providers in the very same facility with the same. Uh, exactly. Patient. All right. Here's a question. Can you comment more on obesity as a factor? You said obesity was more of an upstream issue. Yeah. So, um, uh, in the sense that um, the data is clear that um, you know the higher BMI uh, possibly leads to longer labors, potentially an increased risk for uh, cesarean. Um, so, uh, however, what I meant by upstream measures is that this is a uh, obesity is something that will take a significant statewide and national endeavor uh, to create patient awareness and so forth, um, and it's sort of outside the scope of the toolkit. The toolkit really is meant to focus on clinical things that can be implemented right now um, in each facility, and obesity is more of a, a public health endeavor that has to have multiple folks and organizations involved and, and so forth. Great. Thank you. I think, I think I'm think i scrolling through the questions one last time, and I think we've kind of covered most of them. If you – go ahead, Nancy, were you saying? Oh, I was just going to say there is one question about um, she okay. can't find the readiness survey in the toolkit. The readiness survey is actually not in the toolkit. It's in the implementation guide. So if you go on our website, you will see it um, next to the implementation guide next to the download for the toolkit, and you'll find it there. Right. Okay. Sorry, Julie. Didn't mean to interrupt you. No, uh, it's all good. I just want everybody to get their questions answered. So if anybody has any questions that weren't answered, um, we you can go through the toolkit, and if you still have questions, we're happy to to help you with that. You can just contact us. Um, but other than that, um, I'd like to thank Holly for sharing her no problem. Um, expertise with us and her um, great presenting manner. Um, we're always happy to have Holly around with us. Um, we've really enjoyed um, working with her. And I'd like to thank Nancy for hopping on the call and helping with the questions. Um, so with that, thank you again for attending. We will have the recorded webinar up on the website soon, so keep visiting the website. We're not quite sure when that will be, but it will be soon. Um, so with that, thank you so much, and have a, a, a wonderful day. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Holly. Okay. Bye. Bye. It was good. It was a nice webinar.